Hey everyone, Georgie here with Ukraine Matters. Today we're going to be discussing Ukrainian military, what changes are they looking to make and how it will be reflected on the battlefield in the future in Ukraine. But we're going to start by discussing where are the hotspots on the battlefront so we are aware and keeping tabs on the situation on the ground as well. I'm going to be covering mostly just the hotspots because overall we see that the Russians have exhausted themselves for the most part. They do not have the capability to advance any further and they, we were talking last time that they had about 30,000 reserve troops and now we got a confirmation essentially that these fresh troops have been already sent to Bakhmut and Avdiivka direction to support the, some of the tactical actions that are happening there in hopes of uh, either capturing an encirclement of Bakhmut or continuing uh, encirclement of Avdiivka and essentially uh, getting at least a better position for the coming Ukrainian offensive. So they're going not just all in, but super all in. With that, let's talk about Bakhmut situation. And the most important part here, even without drawing any arrows and lines, is uh, for you to keep tracks of... Uh, there are two kind of tracks for you to think about. There is something that is happening on the outskirts of Bakhmut where uh, Russians are trying to encircle it. And there are also operations within Bakhmut, within the city proper, where the Russian troops are trying to breach inside of the defensive positions within the city and essentially street by street push uh, Ukrainians uh, out of Bakhmut city center. Now, for the A part, essentially, here, the encirclement, we know very clearly this is where Ukrainians are really holding the line. This is where we always uh, hear the reports that uh, Russians are not advancing any for further. And a couple of time, a couple of videos ago, I actually said that I will. I don't believe that Russians will be able to capture Bakhmut. And my logic was as follows: is that Ukrainians have put a lot of effort into securing the flanks and preventing Russians from finishing their encirclement and allowing the resources and the supplies to come into Bakhmut. Whereas uh, for the situation in the B sector uh, is where less of Ukrainian troops are present and the uh, supplies are a little bit harder because it's inside the city. But also the city fights are quite slow and Russians are literally required to fight for every street. And uh, what we need to understand is that Ukrainian offensive should begin roughly end of May uh, middle end of May to June. This is the window that we're looking for. And the offensive most probably is going to have, is going to happen obviously on the south part of uh, Ukraine, but also we would expect that some of the fresh forces will be counterattacking around uh, uh, tension areas around Bakhmut, essentially relieving the pressure from Bakhmut. This means that Russians have roughly now what? four to eight weeks of time to 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 kind of do anything and for a zone as i said that i don't believe that russians will be able to complete encirclement and in b zone this is where we're going to talk about in b zone we're we're seeing that the biggest kind of push that russians are making is from the south side just along the river but here, the important part is that they are essentially taking about a week to capture one street, to capture one block. Because we've heard last week, last video I made, and then people started commenting, oh, Georgie, they captured actually the rest of the Azom complex on the north. I said, yes, but we've heard that they started capturing Azom complex like three weeks ago. So it also matters how much time they take to advance and as i said if it's a time window of four to eight weeks then they do not have that much time to secure their positions inside bakhmut and because the fighting inside of city is always hard and slow i do not believe that russians have enough time to go through all of the city center of bakhmut and capture it especially when it gets to the central part because the further towards center they get the more high-rise buildings the more dense building infrastructure they have to deal with which is 
extremely hard and extremely slow for the Russians. Their tempo is not sufficient to fit within the window of counterattack. That's why I think that Bakhmut will still stand. I hope this will alleviate any kind of questions uh, about what's happening uh, in the Bakhmut, maybe for the next video. Avdiivka, the same situation. People talk about heavy fighting and, and they are indeed heavy fighting. We now hear that Russians are trying to uh, push towards the more of a northern part to kind of extend this claw a little bit more towards Novokalinova. But overall, we see whenever we're talking about, well, have Russians advanced towards uh, uh, Avdiivka, towards encirclement? And the answer is always no, because the only thing we receive is more videos of Russians being uh, killed and vehicles being destroyed. So overall, Avdiivka is, is, is in a um, situation where Russians are throwing some of additional forces that, uh, at it, but it is quite far from being encircled or in a major danger. Avdiivka is fine. With this said, I hope we're going to finish the situation on the front line and we go into discussion. To continue, I'm going to ask you to smack that button of liking because you've been doing it so great in the past couple of videos. And this really is doing wonders for the channel. We were able to reach a lot wider audience and actually start competing with some of the propaganda channels that are just spewing nonsense. And we're going to have a better, proper conversations about Ukraine out there. So thanks for that. But what we want to talk about today is, is that Ukraine uh, is in a position once again where one might say they need to complete their exam. They need to hand in their exam uh, assignment. Uh, we did some kind of discussion like this uh, when Kherson Offensive started uh, and I made a video that, that was actually quite awful. I had to rewatch it recently. And oh boy, that was bad. But the video was uh, making a very good point, it, is that Ukraine did a gamble on the Kherson Offensive about the fact that Ukraine right now needs all of the equipment and then it will be able to execute of the, on that equipment uh, and essentially return some of the territories and additionally provide some kind of supplement for the Western allies in a moral sense saying that we are continuously continuously supporting the victor. We're not going to be talking today about the defeatist mentality. There is a talk for another time. But overall, this was the perspective very, very much in the West. And we are seeing pretty much the same situation right now. Ukraine has been on defensive for a while now. And while the experts are quite understanding of the situation Ukraine is in, and actually many of them are saying that Ukraine should not rush the counteroffensive, there is also a lot of this soft political pressure that is uh, right now building on Ukraine because Ukraine has asked for an increased capabilities to, to be provided to it. So it's like tanks and uh, infantry fighting vehicles and APCs. And essentially it's, um, it's, uh, they, they acquired some kind of a, like a depth to the public within the Western societies and the politicians uh, to deliver on that promise. Now, obviously it's completely immoral, but we're not discussing it here. I'm just trying to describe you the situation. And uh, this exam is, is, is an extremely awful position to be in for Ukraine because obviously uh, they are now pressured to have to deliver on it. But I want to encourage you by saying that Ukraine has a lot of power accumulated because Ukrainian command has shown us that they are quite capable in planning their operations. They have been also planning this uh, counteroffensive operations together with the American allies, uh, with American command, and they are always planning based on the worst scenario. I already told in the community section that Ukraine is finishing out by the 1st of April formation of their, uh, of their eight offensive guard groups that are going to be focused on the offensive. They will be joining the 12 additional brigades uh, that are formed for the offensive purposes and the older brigades. So we might expect 
quite a lot of troops that are dedically, dedicatedly ironclad, have been trained on how to conduct offensive operations. So all in all, Ukraine is preparing for the offensive operation, it's preparing for it um, knowing the Ukrainian command, judging by the negative scenario. I think they have a minimum point of what they want to achieve is to reach essentially Mariupol, to cut the uh, uh, Zaporizhia in half, and maybe even uh, get to the borders of Crimea. But the important part, what I want to underscore here, is that this is a minimal objective. So if we will see that the, what, what we might see quite a lot is that the, if the Russian defenses will not hold, if the morale of the Russian troops collapses, then we might see an operation that will not end at their minimum, right? I am not saying that Ukraine 100 and 110 percent certainly will enter Crimea, but that is a non-zero chance because the accumulated power that Ukraine has is quite extensive. And they always the question was on our mind was, does Russia have enough uh, defenses to receive that kind of offensive push? And is there, are their mobilized troops good enough? And we're going to check it quite soon. Ukraine, compared to Kharkiv offensive, now has a lot, of, a lot more firepower than it had before. Uh, right now, Russian troops are not as uh, sparsely populated, so they have some defensive positions. So they're both, both for and against. But I would be more edging towards for Ukrainian offensive, mostly because that's how I'm just biased on this channel, but also by seeing and, and hearing the perspectives of while a lot of the Western leaders and the Ukrainian allies are saying, yes, that you need to complete this exam, but also anal analytics saying that Ukraine has a lot of firepower and capabilities and troops that are ready to execute on that offensive. But that comes with uh, a big discussion. Recently, we had a discussion about how many problems there are for Ukrainian military. And this discussion has been going on for a while now. Most importantly, uh, obviously, Ukraine is on defensive and a lot of people are always saying it's like, well, why does Ukraine send like, you know, like some of the poor troops, they don't have enough uh, equipment on the front lines. And I always tell you because the defensive purpose of the defensive operation is to inflict as much damage as possible and don't allow the enemy essentially to have any kind of successes, strategic successes while using as least resources possible. So essentially make sure that the enemy uses their offensive resources while not using, uh, while using as few resources as possible defensively. So that means if it's a choice of like, should I engage right now an elite offensive unit that can be used in the future offensive, or maybe some of the poor trained troops right now, it's an awful, awful choice, you know, but this is the choices that command in the war situation are actually forced to make. War is not a choice where you have good option and a bad option. War is where you have bad option and terrible option. And if you're not ready to settle for a bad option, then most likely what you're gonna end up with is a little bit down the line, you're gonna end up with a terrible option and a completely devastating one. And that's why a lot of the discussion of, oh, if Ukraine should have just fallen back and so on, we don't have the access to all of the information. And that's why we didn't know what kind of bad and awful choices Ukraine had in front of it. So that's why when we hear a critique of the Ukrainian army, a lot of it is emotional, yes, but some of it is also valid. And the valid critique is, is what, what I want to talk about to you today, because I've heard anal analytics uh, uh, analysts talking about what is the problems of Ukrainian military and how they would see uh, their being them being resolved. And here I want to introduce you to the concept that is called multi-dimensional dimension multi-domain operations uh, this is the concept of how essentially the u.s 
wants to fight their wars going forward. A lot of the previous kind of um, uh, US doctrine was based around the non-equivalent exchanges where, you, uh, where US was fighting some of the smaller powers in the world and but they also wanted to at some point mitigate the growing threats of Russia because it was considered a threat back then and China as well. So that's why US has developed this um, doctrine on how, on how to fight on the multi-domain level. So multi-domain being like both in air, land, maritime, space, and cyberspace. So all of those working interconnectedly. And this is, you can say, a modern future warfare scenario. Now, obviously, Ukraine is not fighting a future war. And a that is showing. A lot of what Ukraine is doing right now is based in like 20th century methodology like because they are trying to focus on overwhelming strengths on doing some kind of big operations and 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 uh, gathering reserves to try to overwhelm the enemy and so on this is an older older style warfare a lot of the question, questions and threats of this older star warfare has already been answered by the multi-domain uh, operations doctrine. And uh, so the critique for Ukrainian forces were that a lot of them have been focusing on this older style 20th century warfare that we are seeing again trenches we're seeing again uh like some kind of positional battles we're seeing again uh, if there, uh, there is an advancement that this is in like an older style like uh we're talking about right now like a tank advancements this all thing don't have to exist what Ukraine can have is a very agile fighting force that uh, whenever an enemy tries to attack them uh, in this kind of fashion, that they would send some kind of a force which is mobile, which has uh, good communication in it when, between each other, between different elements. And all of these different elements would uh, uh, enforce short-time devastating damage. So imagine... Russia is gathering for some kind of a push towards, let's say, Solidar. So they're gathering their forces. At some point, um, like a couple of brigades of units that are highly trained with different capabilities, including drones, including cameras, satellite imagery, additional artillery support, long-range artillery, smart targeted artillery, will just arrive to where Russia is gathering up they will select like this uh, narrow part of the front line, like 20, 30 kilometers wide, and let's say about 100 kilometers long. And then they say, it's like, our target is to destroy any kind of capabilities the enemy is having on this small particular part of the front line. Basically eliminating the any kind of thrusts that Russian can deliver even before it happens. And the same goes for the offensive operations. Ukraine can still has these older time, older time doctrines like where uh, they can send in like tank, uh, tank lines, the APC lines, their troops into the enemy territory. But before that happens, the, these mobile brigades would arrive to positions where the breakthrough should be happening then again, select this part of the field. They will uh, apply their uh, technology to demine, like uh, advanced technology to demine, execute like on their smart precision strikes on any kind of enemy defensive position, and again, burn through the whole path for the forces to break through into that narrow path that the, these couple of brigades could. Uh, uh, just burn out. So basically the troops would be advancing without major fighting against the station repositions. Uh, what was, what's Ukraine is essentially going to be doing? That is the future of the warfare. And the critique is that Ukraine has not been delivering these capabilities as fast as people were hoping, but it's been doing it in a, in a, in a slow fashion. We see that Ukraine is trying to do, but the challenge is that they are struggling right now is that uh, to execute on this to have these couple of brigades that can do this kind of activity to come and kill essentially hunter killer uh, brigades uh, 
uh, is that it requires significant investment in logistics, which Ukraine is struggling with. We know that significant investment and in resources because these kind of brigades, they need to have a lot of resources available to them, essentially almost ad hoc. Like, so they say like, okay, we need to burn through this tomorrow because tomorrow is when the Russians are gathering in this area. So now we need like uh, all of the artillery ammunition to this precise, precise position to be delivered. That is not very easy. And uh, uh, we've seen already that Ukraine is trying to transition step by step towards it. There is a, for example, a K2 brigade, uh, not a brigade, but a K2 battalion or a unit that's uh, showing a lot of these interconnectivity where uh, maybe you've seen recently where they're using artillery support to support the fighting on the ground with the forces on the ground. So they're using both the land domains and also precision targeted artillery strike on the advancing forces to eliminate a threat that is approaching the uh, defensive positions of Ukrainians without even uh, going forward. Additionally, the tactical small level drone warfare that Ukraine is executing on is also an element of this. So Ukraine is slowly but surely building towards this future proof situation. But the challenges of this, and this is the challenges where they need to be resolved, is that Ukraine need to have a better control and command structures. So that's where something like Bradley, something like modern equipment will come in, is because the communication uh, functions on those vehicles are better. It's when uh, Ukraine will get additional reconnaissance assets. So Ukraine needs additional drone capabilities so they can uh, get the surveillance, long range surveillance. They also will need to integrate, and this has been happening, the command and control points that will be essentially monitoring what's the situation on their local part of the front line and then having essentially light feet to the uh, to these uh, hunter killer br brigades in the future, and and this is the challenge that Ukraine is facing. And a lot of the analysts are saying that this is the way how Ukraine will win the war. So while uh, while right now Ukraine is fighting this twentieth century twentieth century conventional warfare with Russia, if it's just going to continue in this way, it's just going to be an extremely costly war. So that's why Ukraine still needs more capability. It needs air power, it needs drones and whatnot to expand on their existing uh, starter units like, like K2 um, unit that fighting and expand those capabilities of interconnectivity to build these hunter-killer brigades. And I am really looking forward to see that Ukraine is going to execute on that at least... Uh, I hope so that it will, because otherwise it's just going to be uh, too costly and we do not want Ukraine to pay much more in blood. Thank you so much for watching today. Thank you so much to supporters of this channel. Uh, please, please, please join uh, us this Saturday with me. Uh, going to be streaming with Operator Starsky together to get some kind of support for the Ukrainian armed forces support Ukrainian armed forces, go into the first comment of the video, donate to Ukrainian armed forces. And if you want to support me, please uh, subscribe on Patreon, YouTube membership, or buy me a coffee link. And most importantly, join Discord where we can discuss uh, any kind of uh, news and activities and you can just talk with me whenever you want. Slava Ukraini guys, I love you all and I'll see you next time.